And now Westwood One presents this week's Star Trek Profile, ELO. Brought to you by the makers of Tums, the sodium-free antacid that's rich in calcium. I'm Phil Hendry, and for the next hour, we'll hear the music of the Electric Light Orchestra and the words of the man behind it, writer, vocalist, musician, producer, Jeff Lynne. Star Trek Profiles ELO after this. The story of ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra, begins in the north of England in the industrial city of Birmingham. Back in the early 60s, it was a city like Liverpool filled with pubs and rock groups. That's where Jeff Lynne grew up, but his early musical surroundings were a lot more conventional. My grandparents were musical, you know, they used to play, they used to read music and play instruments. Um, my father's quite musical, but he never learned to play an instrument, but he picks out tunes with one finger on the piano. And uh, I suppose, you know, when I was little, I used to, I mean, my father used to play uh, lots of classical stuff, and uh, you know, which I used to hate, really. You know, I used to try and get out of the house if that was on. And, um, and then I forgot all about classical music until, you know, until we started forming ELO, and I thought, what a good sound that'd be for pop music, you know, it'd sound really good. In the beginning, ELO's music was labeled classical rock by a lot of critics because of the use of strings. But Jeff Lynne doesn't like that label and says his most important musical inspiration came from his teenage love for rock and roll. I don't read music or anything. I just uh, got a guitar that was a, it was a plastic one, actually, the first one I had, off a friend of mine. It was had it since he was a little kid. And uh, I learnt a few tunes on one string up and down the neck. I only had one string on it. just taught myself. Well, I used to watch local groups, you know, playing round about. Uh, one of them was a group called the Night Riders that I used to watch when I couldn't play. And the, the lead guitarist in that group, they used to play local in Birmingham. And um, this would be when I was about 15. And uh, he used to let me have a go on his guitar. I used to be a cheeky lad and say, can I have a go on your guitar, please? And he'd show me a couple of chords and things. And I'd rush home, because by then I'd got a Spanish guitar, you know, a little cheap one that my father had bought me. About cost about five pounds or something. Really hard action, it was hard to play. Make your fingers bleed, you know, all that sort of thing. It was just, it was just so, Fabulous to be able to play a tune on a guitar, you know, it was just, you, you see these people on TV and they could play and you go, oh, fantastic. And I went to these, these little local dance things in, in Birmingham and saw these groups playing live there and I just couldn't believe that ordinary people could do that. You know, I was still astounded that these blokes actually could speak. You know, and I was talking to them and they'd let me have a go on the guitar. It was just like a total thrill, the whole thing. And for the next, you know, three years or so, that's all I ever did was just play a guitar all day and all night. In 1966, Oh, <laughs> yeah. I went professional when I was 18, so I'd had some little jobs, I'd done little jobs of work, you know, from when I left school. And then I got this chance to be a professional guitar player, which meant you didn't have to go to work, basically. <laughs> That's about how professional it was. With this group called the Night Riders that I'd watched when I was, you know, younger, and learnt some things off the lead guitarist. And suddenly I got this chance to, to play with this group. I'd, I'd gone to an audition, and uh, I got the job. And then it was fantastic then, because the next two years, I don't think we had one night off, we used to play just in Birmingham. And there's millions of pubs and clubs and dances and stuff. Just never stopped playing from about 66 to 68. That's all we did, we just play every night. And I loved it, because it makes you play really well, and you get really tight. You know, that was a group called The Idol Race. We changed their name to The Idol Race from the night rise after about a month of me being with them. And um, it was just fantastic to play every night. I mean, it was... Suddenly I was rich as well, I was only earning like, you know, £20 a week or something, but you never had to spend any money because you were always out at the place that you were playing and people would buy you drinks and, and it was really, really good fun, you know, fabulous, a, a, gr a very good grounding for, you, for, for the trade. Ultimately, the idol race evolved into ELO and Jeff Lynne was able to mix his rock and roll with the sound of strings. A lot of the inspiration for that came from the Beatles and songs like I Am the Walrus. We'll hear about that and Jeff's trip to the studio to actually see the Fab Four when we continue with this week's Star Trek profile, ELO. I'm Phil Hendry. Like a lot of musicians in the 60s, Jeff Lynne was heavily influenced by the Beatles. In his case, by their lavish production and use of strings and special effects on the Sgt. Pepper album and songs like Strawberry Fields and I Am the Walrus. So it was particularly thrilling for Jeff to actually get to watch the Beatles in the studio one day. The year was 1968, when Jeff was still in ELO's predecessor, Idol Race. Well, it was when we were making that first album, you know, and we thought, like, oh, great, this is good. And anyway, the engineer gets a phone call when we're in the studio, trying to make our little record, you know, we'd sold about 25 copies. Um, but we thought it was really important. And he gets a phone call saying, uh, 
It's his friend who works at Abbey Road. And he said, the Beatles are in. Do you want to come down and have a look to him, to, to this engineer? And he said to us, um, we said to me, he said, do you want to go and see the Beatles at Abbey Road? I said, nah, do us a favour. <laughs> and we were down there in a flash, you know, it was about a couple of miles away. And I just couldn't believe it. And uh, there they all were, you know, they're all they were doing different sessions. Like it, they, were, they were making the White Album. And, um, I mean, it was a total numbing experience, you know. You, there they were playing on the records that, that you hear. And there was Paul McCartney sat on the mixer playing his bass. He was playing a Fender jazz bass with a, the price tag price tag still hanging off it. You know, he probably just got it in and just playing bass on it. And what turned out was one of the peculiar ones was uh, why don't we do it in the road? But then, we down the corridor, we went to see uh, John Lennon and George Harrison doing Glass on You, which was, and George Martin conducting the strings, we saw all that as well, fantastic. The music of ELO, written and produced by Jeff Lynn. Because of the complexity of the production, a lot of people thought the lyrics were very complex, too. And as with the Beatles, people read in a lot of hidden meanings. But Jeff says often interpretations got way out of hand. You know, I was trying to write words that are... that sound nice. You know, that, that actually do mean something. They've got depth to them in a certain amount. You know, not pretentious. I don't mean to be pretentious and say, oh, I'm this great poet. You know, I'm not... I'm nowhere near a poet, but um, I like to write songs that sound nice really and do have a message not, not a message of like you've got to go out and buy one of these but um, just as, so somebody can feel um, either happy or sad because of it you know that's why songwriters write songs really to, to put over a certain feeling a lot of them get misconstrued totally you know they, they mean nothing like what you intend them to mean because we had a song called Living Thing once and this is quite funny because there was these two big outrageous meanings of it. We kept getting told that this is what it meant. I read in the papers that this is what it meant. One said it was about abortion, which was nothing to do with abortion whatsoever. And the other one said it was about save the whale. It was nothing to do about whales. And another, and a friend of mine thought it was about a dog. And I just couldn't believe it, you know. I thought, good grief. Um, it was just a song. And the funny thing was, it was a, a lyric that I'd rushed in and done because I didn't like the words at the last minute. It was called, it was all about a Spanish holiday, believe it or not, living thing. Do you remember that song? And, um, and I hated the words at the last minute, just before we were due to mix. So I wrote, rewrote these words ever so quick, and that was what became the hit. I suppose it's about love, really. Love being a living thing, you know. Some bands have several writers and producers, but with ELO, it's Jeff Lynn who's the dominant one. He writes the songs and then puts together demo tapes to illustrate the way he wants them arranged. Remember, he neither reads nor writes music. It's an intense process for Jeff, but one that provides him with the greatest satisfaction in his life. You know, I, I like to get up in the morning and go straight and get on my keyboards and my guitars. You know, in the morning, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock. And um, just sit there and sometimes something will come out. Sometimes I get about three songs. Sometimes nothing at all. Like, I'll just be playing away for a couple of hours. And I realise that nothing's going to happen today. It's not very inspiring. And I put me drummer on, the electric drummer, you know, the uh, drum machine, which is a really inspiring toy to have. Because if you've got a great beat going down already, it's, uh, it's very inspiring. But even then, you know, you can come up with nothing. But a lot of times you come up with bits of songs, like maybe three chords even, that you save, because sometimes those three chords will end up being really good. Jeff Lynn feels that his early writing was too complex for a lot of people to understand, and he points to the ELO album A New World Record and the song Telephone Line as evidence of his movement toward music that's more accessible to a wide audience. More on that when we continue with this week's Star Trek profile, ELO. I'm Phil Hendry. In the beginning, ELO was considered a rather eclectic group. Their music was lavishly produced with lots of strings, classical overtones, and complex arrangements. But Jeff Lynne says that changed over time, and he sees a major transition in 1977 with the album A New World Record. The songs became a lot better. The songs were a lot better, and there was about four hit singles, because I think that was the transition, the fact that my songwriting had improved to a point where it was... like commercial people could actually relate to the songs, which is the first time, I think, because all the other songs were like about weird things like that nobody except about three people could ever associate with. And I did a song called Telephone Line. Even though I didn't think it would be like a big hit, you know, I thought it'd be a hit, but it was a really big hit for us, sold a million over here. And, uh, and I realised 
after a, a bit, you know, like a bit later, that it was a good song and it, people could relate to it. And people used to come up to me and say, oh, I really know what you mean about that song. You know, that's, I feel just like that. And it was, and I realised it was, you know, getting to people in the way that I intended, really. That you, or every songwriter intends, you only write, you only write songs so people can hear them. That's basically, you know, the why you do it. Obviously you do it because you enjoy doing it. But if nobody ever hears them, ever, it's a pretty pointless thing if only you hear them. Um, and suddenly we sold like millions of this album. And before that, you know, we only sold like, well, we sold half a million around the world, I think, on any previous album. And that was the transition. I think the songs were more accessible to people and, and they could relate to them. That song firmly established ELO as a pop band. And while some fans criticize the group for selling out, Jeff Lynn says he likes to be pop. Now I look at it as a very positive thing. You know, that's... To me, all I've ever wanted to do is write good pop songs, you know. I've never had any pretensions to anything else. Obviously, I've had pretensions of making it sound big and have all stuff going. But basically, I've only ever wanted to write nice tunes that people could like. You know, that's all I've ever wanted. And uh, it's taken me a long time to learn how to do it. Because a lot of stuff... It's very hard to write a simple song, you know, to write a good one. It's very easy to write a complicated song. Anybody can do it. Because it's a load of, you know, it's, it's a load of waffle, basically. But to write one that's very simple and straight to the point, and it's got a good tune, is very, very hard. I think the process of writing a song and having it, I think, getting a good vocal on it, and that, that point when it's almost finished, not quite finished, is how I love it best. And when it's finished, I'm, it's a bit of an anticlimax. You know, I feel like, oh, it's finished, I've got nothing to do. You know, for, you feel like after a couple of weeks after you finish the record, but then you start thinking of other ideas and new songs and then... Yeah, I just love recording. The whole process is my greatest satisfaction. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I still love it just the same as ever. Recording to me is the greatest thing ever, making songs up and putting them on tape. I still get, a, sometimes I get the, you know, I still get wonderment at it that I'm allowed to do all this because there's all this equipment that costs, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, and it's me, I'm, I'm in charge of it. I'm, I'm in the studio and nobody else can come in and say, get out. And it's, I still feel that sometimes, you know, that I'm really lucky to be doing it because I absolutely love doing it and there's nothing I would rather do ever than make records. And that's a lot more than a job for Jeff Lynn. It's a passion. We'll hear more from Jeff in a moment when we continue with this week's Star Trek profile, ELO. I'm Phil Hendry. ELO's success with their audience has not always carried over to the critics, and that sometimes hurts, particularly when Jeff Lynn and the band put so much effort into their records. Fortunately, reviews don't mean that much in terms of whether people are going to listen to your record or not. They don't mean very much at all. But it, it is a bit soul-destroying when you, you do work, like, like you say, all day and all night, trying to get this thing as good as you possibly can. And, you, you know, you're really dedicated to it, and which I am. And I love doing it. So I mean, you got to if you put yourself in a position to be knocked down, you, that's what you have to put up with. But it is a shame when people just dismiss it as rubbish or whatever, you know. And that's why I'm loath to say anything's rubbish, really, any music, because I know that somewhere somebody has gone to a, done the best they can possibly do on that piece of work, you know. And even if it's even if I think it's bad, I do say it myself sometimes. That's bad, and then I know how they would feel if. If they've done the best and, and worked really hard on it, you know, it's not very nice to have somebody say, that's a load of crap. The music of Jeff Lynne and ELO from their 1981 album, Time. Their latest effort just out is called Balance of Power, and once again, Jeff feels it represents an evolution of style. As he said, inspired by the classics and the Beatles, Jeff began in the 60s with intricate music, lots of strings and involved production. Now in the 80s, Jeff feels he's simplified his style, and in many ways he says his current approach is a lot more difficult than the old days, when he feels he may have sacrificed quality for sheer quantity of sound. I think simplicity is, is, the, is it's one of the hardest things to do. Without, you know, simplicity, you can have it so simple that it's, that it's also banal. But to write simple stuff, uh, simple melodies, is, is, is quite hard, really, I think. You can hit bugged down in all these diversions, you know. And I think um, you've got to discipline yourself to not use too much stuff. I I've always sort of overblown productions, I think, in the past, you know, and, and probably because I hide behind the productions, you know, bury the voice a bit underneath and bury this, that, and the other, and cover some of it over with a blanket of something else, like 2,000 violin players. You know, to, just out of insecurity, maybe, I don't know. 
But now I can, um, I can let the voice sing out now, and I don't cringe when I hear it. You know, so it's good. I've probably improved in that respect, and I think I'm a better producer now. The Electric Light Orchestra and Calling America from their latest album, Balance of Power. Wrapping up this week's Star Trek profile, brought to you by the makers of Tums, the sodium-free antacid that's rich in calcium. This special program was written and produced by Bert Kleinman, associate producer Carol Kleinman, production and engineering Ray Klein. Star Trek Profiles came to you from Westwood One. Executive producer, Norm Pattis.